The other day, I started a hepatitis B course. This includes three injections to protect yourself from hepatitis B, which is an occupational hazard in the place that I work. This infection can be transferred through what we call sharps or needles. Most people don't need to worry about coming into contact with needles, at least not in the workplace, which is why it isn't really offered to people outside of certain job occupations, such as working in healthcare or public services. And although people shouldn't have to be aware of coming into contact with sharps or needles, sadly, over the past month or so, there has been a group of people that have increased awareness around needles and being fearful of being injected with things. And that group is primarily young women. Why, you ask? Because slipping a pill or powder into someone's drink just doesn't, doesn't cut it anymore. No, people have decided to try their luck by spiking women in nightclubs through injecting them with drugs. Should we all just stay in? Should we never go outside again? Should we never drink? Should we never be vulnerable outside again? Should we never enter a public space at night time? Should we never have a boogie? Should we never drink a little bit too much? Now nah, let's just stay inside in our bedrooms locked away. Maybe then we'll avoid all of this. I mean, I'm lucky enough to not have to worry about one type of infection, but what about all of the other infections that can be spread through the use of needles? And better yet, what about the effect of the drugs being administered in the first place? Many people have made the case that injection is something that's quite difficult to pull off. It's hard to get a needle into a club and it's very hard to reach a vein. And it's even harder to do all of these things successfully and go unnoticed, which may be true. I don't know, I got an A star in GCSE biology, but I never really learned about the administration of drugs at least not in an educational setting. Anyway, for any potential employers or my employer, if you find these videos, that was a joke. I'm actually terrified of needles. I hate them. So, um, you won't catch me doing that anytime soon. I, like many others, was outraged by this. Not only do we have to cover our drinks or cease to drink, in clubs, which is what I do. I don't buy a drink because of things like this. Now, not only do we have to be aware of our drinks, now we have to be aware of a potential stab in the back. As if the metaphor of being drugged through a powder or a pill in your drink wasn't a stab in the back enough. However, at the time of these incidents occurring, it wasn't really that big of a thing. It was quite rare and few people actually reported it. Not that that decreases the severity because it doesn't matter how many people were spiked. The fact that people were being spiked by injections is worryingly weird and creepy enough. I went to visit my friends who were still at university to celebrate Halloween. And when I woke up the next morning, I found on social media that girls that went to my uni were spiked at a university event that my friends often go to, an event that I could have easily gone to. Students were being spiked by other students at a student run event in the hub of the student union on a university campus. I mean, the penny already dropped for me when someone reported their experience of this weeks ago, but this, this made my whole bank account hit the floor. Actually, that might have just been the vicarious amounts of takeaways that I ordered that weekend. And this inspired the campaign that was first known as Girls' Night In, the subject of this video. As slightly mentioned, this video will discuss some topics that some people might find distressing. Even though it won't be graphic, it might still include things that will upset you. So just be warned if that's something that happens for you. So when you think of Girls' Night In, what tends to come to mind? Is it face masks, painting your nails, PJs and makeovers, watching a chick flick and talking about boys? To be honest though, I wouldn't really know. The extent of my friends nights in usually include me lying hungover on a sofa with a takeaway, watching a really shitty horror movie, which 
I don't even get to understand it anyway because someone is always talking through the major points of the movie. Or it included six of us squeezing into one person's tiny room. Oh, I'm assuming. Anyway, the point is, regardless of whether it's a girls' night in or just a night in, it's associated with comfort and bonding. It's cosy and positive and safe. Girls' night in, in the context that we're talking about, has a greater political meaning. The campaign was to boycott local bars and nightclubs on particular nights, to put pressure on venues to do more about spiking. Certain groups wanted measures including providing lids for drinks and first aid and drug misuse training for staff and a petition was actually made calling for clubs to be legally required to search guests for spiking paraphernalia on entry, which collected over 90,000 signatures. On the Edinburgh's Girls' Night In Instagram page, one person posted that we deserve to have fun on our nights out and it's not fair that our club experiences are being tainted by fear, worry and anxiety that we are going to get drugged. Organisers of the Girls' Night Inn boycotts in Nottingham told The Independent that they first thought stories of women being spiked were hearsay and like a horror story, especially the ones including injections. But then when it actually happened at their university and to the people that they know and they could put a name and face to, they realised just how outrageous it was. One student pointed out that yes, you can be conscious about your drink and keeping it close, but how are you supposed to avoid being injected with something? So the whole thing is actually a boycott to stand in solidarity with the women who have been spiked but also to women and people in general who are at risk of spiking, whether that be injection related or drink related. In this sense, it does have a level of bonding to it, perhaps why the phrase girls night in has caught on so well. It's catchy and understandable and loaded with political connotations and my wet hair is gonna fall out on my towel, I hate girls night in. But why a boycott? Even if every woman in the country didn't go out, there would still be people going out drinking. And even so, not all women are going to abide by this boycott. And possibly one of the biggest criticisms of this event is that doesn't it exclude other victims of spiking? After all, it's not only women who are at risk. One of the biggest straw mans used to criticise this campaign is its branding of Girls Night Inn, which after some backlash has been rebranded as The Big Night Inn or Blank Night Inn. Of course though, the original name did receive the majority of publicity, so that's kind of the thing that's caught on in the first wave of announcements regarding this boycott. The reason why I call this a straw man is because a lot of people have defaced the point of the boycott by making it out to be exclusive and disregarding anybody that is not a woman. In some cases, this point is made with disingenuity. Not being made because the detractor actually cares about the exclusive language, but simply to tear down the organisation for their own selfish reasons. However, that being said, there is an exclusionary aspect to this language, even if that isn't intentional. The reason why the phrase Girls' Night In was used was to parody the phrase Girls' Night Out, which refers to a night out that many women go on with their friends. However, it's kind of highlighting what this organisation is all about because it's about abstaining from going out and boycotting these venues instead. However, on the surface, this does exclude other identities that are taking part in this event and others that are vulnerable to spiking, like other marginalised genders. However, the most prominent argument that I've been seeing is, well, men get spiked too, which isn't very relevant. It doesn't really address anything. The organisation is about upping safety measures against spiking, and if spiking does affect everyone, if spiking does affect men too, like a lot of people want to point out on social media, then that organisation is for them because it will increase safety measures for those who get spiked. And if those that get spiked are men, then the men will 
benefit. It's a wonder how some people get so far in life with so little brain cells. Framing of language does often affect some people's responses to organisations and movements. I mean, just look at feminism, for example. Though at its core, feminism is meant to represent everybody because it represents the equality of the sexes. And that doesn't just include female issues, but male issues and intersex issues as well. However, because of the femme, at the start of the name, a lot of people only connect feminism with women's rights and so are left feeling like the organisation doesn't represent them. Even though, if you look at what feminism is, it definitely does not only concern women's rights. But no, people, people want to see a word and know exactly what the thing's about. They don't want to do their research, they just, they want everything handed to them on a silver platter. Must like women with their rights, but you know, let's not. And it is mostly women that have come forward, so of course people are going to associate it with women, even if it's not only women that are spiked. I'm not trying to belittle the problems of exclusive language as somebody that does a lot of language analysis and is fascinated by what language conveys in the smallest and most subtle ways. However, if you're only criticising the language to tear down the organisation, well... I just can't really sympathise with your point. We all have different experiences and it's not me being excluded through this use of language. And it's true when things like this arise, like for example missing white woman syndrome which dominates violence against women talks, intersectionality is often left behind. This is becoming about young, usually middle class, white students. At least this is how others feel that aren't really being represented. I think it's also really important to point out this language was used in a rush of political momentum. These girls that made these clubs and these awareness campaigns weren't trying to exclude other identities and genders. However, they were simply naive and not used to creating political campaigns. Most of them are university students that have never had to think about the critical engagement of the media before. Unfortunately, they got ahead of themselves and now their language is being analysed with a critical lens that they didn't even think to adopt. Which, yeah, you could say might be a point of privilege or a point of ignorance. Even though it is damaging, I don't think the intention was, so it's important to find a nuance when we critique these kinds of things. But different people will face varying levels of danger, and so inclusivity and intersectionality is important, even to the nitty gritty and down to the core of the language that we use. The criticism is essential if we are to avoid the whole thing becoming whitewashed and cisnormative and heteronormative. Many have also picked up on the problem of requesting security to be upped and increased. Many people believe that this will unfairly target many racialized and poor people and grant security more power than needed. If security aren't doing enough to prevent this thing happening anyway, how is giving them more power to search going to help. Many anecdotes from people at my old university and others online and victims of spiking reference how when people are spiked, security would often just throw them out and treat them as someone else's problem instead of investigating what happened. And this isn't just a thing that happens with spiking. I remember I once worked at a pub and <sighs> People would get very drunk. You wouldn't know by British drinking culture. When we wanted to give people glasses of water, we were discouraged because we should sell it. Because obviously tap water's free. And again, if someone was too drunk, the attitude was, kick them out. Don't make sure they're all right. Instead, many have suggested that staff undertake training in drug misuse and the ability to recognise when someone has been spiked. Many spokespeople for these organisations have actually come out saying that they're against the increasing of power and security and instead support the retraining 
due to the bias that they acknowledge comes with searching people. And the thing that bothers me, I think, is the other reactions that come from people that should probably support this kind of movement. Some older feminists don't like the idea that we're boycotting because they believe, and I think it's a fair point to make, that boycotting puts the onus on the victim to avoid spiking. Just don't go out, then you won't get spiked. You shouldn't have to stay in to avoid getting drugged. But the thing is, many that are campaigning for these boycotts have actually cited this as a way of empowerment. We're choosing to stay in. We're not being told to. People are choosing to stay in or protest on the street instead of filling the pockets of the organisations that are doing nothing. Of course, women and other people of marginalised genders shouldn't have to stay in, but I think that's the whole point. The whole point is, yes, you get it, we shouldn't have to stay in. And maybe if we can get enough people to say, well, why are you staying in, you shouldn't have to, the point will finally be made and people will finally understand how stupid it is to put the responsibility of safety against drugging on us. The outrage at the idea of a boycott and at the idea of having us act because of what happened to us, that's what we need so that people realise it shouldn't be our responsibility and that the responsibility should be on the perpetrator and the organisations that are complicit in these things happening. Many organisations are in agreement with the distractions and have amended themselves to suit this criticism. They've resolved claims against the boycotts and done what they could to communicate with the public. For example, I got in touch with Belfast Night In, a organisation of a boycott in Northern Ireland, and they were kind enough to issue me this statement to share. On Wednesday the 27th of October, we are calling for a boycott of all clubs and bars in Belfast in a stand against spiking. Across the UK, there is a spiking epidemic. People should not have to be fearful of their safety on a night out. Enough is enough. Over the last year, we have seen and heard horror stories of gender-based attacks, sadly many being victims from marginalised community. This spiking epidemic is unfortunately another one of these. In Northern Ireland, we are living with no appropriate access to abortion and no strategy dedicated to tackling gender-based violence. Our local institutions are not doing enough to keep us safe and prevent spiking, and we need change now. We would like to work with establishments to see the implementation of bystander intervention training for staff, anti-spiking provisions provided for patrons such as cup covers and test strips, and easy to identify dedicated welfare officers to support and advise victims. We want to encourage bars to engage with schemes like Ask for Angela, where bar staff and customers can seek help and a safe way home if they are feeling vulnerable or targeted. We do not, however, think that a nationwide petition calling for increased searches on entry is an effective solution to the problem, as it would undoubtedly affect marginalised groups disproportionately. We will not be satisfied until we are all safe. It's important that the heart of this cause is intersectional and acknowledges that spiking affects more than just women. Anyone is vulnerable to spiking and it is crucial that the measures that are put in place protect everyone. Historically, stay-at-home orders have been issued to women and other marginalised groups. The owner should not be on victims to protect themselves. It is never our fault. This is a boycott, not a call for people to stay at home to stay safe. We are currently contacting and collating responses from Belfast bars and clubs in order to better understand the policies and procedures that are already in place before we formulate how we think establishments can better protect patrons. Venues have a duty of care to their customers, but the government should also be doing more. Gender-based violence and spiking are a prevalent and dangerous issue, and we will continue to fight for our safety until change comes. Best wishes, Team Belfast first night in. Seems like a pretty good plan to me. All these organisations want is for people to be safe. To be safe on a night out, to be safe in the streets, to be safe walking home from work, to be safe walking to work, to be safe going to the supermarket. Things that many of us don't feel safe when we're doing. Which is fucking weird. And should be unacceptable by now. Thank you for watching this video to the very end. I hope that you're doing well and that you're safe 
and that nothing like this is something that you have to worry about or experience when you're having fun with your friends. If you enjoyed this video please leave a like and subscribe if you're new and also comment what your thoughts are on the subject. And with all that said and done, I'll see you soon.